Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumor hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest this week is a trailblazer, innovator and legend of the gaming world, and the first face carved into many gamers Mount Rushmore of designers. He's the inventor of the collectible card game and the popularizer of programmed movement. He's worked extensively in the digital and analog worlds and is still publishing board games to this day. But he will go down in history for the game he designed while studying for his PhD at Penn State, a card game called Magic the Gathering. My guest this week is Richard Garfield. Richard, thank you very much for coming to the cabin. Oh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so I want to start by, so you had a very peripatetic childhood. You travel, ar you traveled around a lot because your your father was an architect. How was that as a child, and do you think that affected who you became as an adult? Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, uh, your childhood, I think, always uh, uh, helps form you, but it's really hard to tangle out the different uh, the different parts of that. Uh, we did travel around a lot, and so that uh, forced me to uh, perhaps create a little bit more of my own games, uh, but certainly fuels innate, so uh, I, I won't necessarily uh, credit that entirely with it. And, and so where do, you, where, do, where do you say that you come from? Where's, where's your hometown? Well, uh, I say I was born in Philadelphia. And uh, we traveled around a lot uh, when I was young, uh, uh, internationally and 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 lo and around the country. Uh, but usually, I say I come from uh, the north, uh, the northwest, uh, because we moved to Oregon when I was in uh, in uh, uh, junior high, and my family is still there, and uh, and I have returned there after my education. So, when did you start gaming, and were you a sort of natural designer? Because, you know, I speak to some people and they say the minute they start gaming, they start, you know, doing variants and stuff on, on things that they're playing. Uh, yeah, what were those first games and were you designing right from the off? Uh, I, I tinkered with games very young, uh, but it didn't really become a passion until uh, I encountered Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. And uh, when I heard the description of it, I immediately uh, uh, ran out and and tried to construct my own version of it because there wasn't any available locally. And I made sort of a board game that was kind of vaguely D and D flavored, uh, and and it was nothing like Dungeons and Dragons because I sort of didn't get the uh, the whole uh, uh, idea behind it. Uh, uh, but uh, once I did get my hands on it and started playing it. it D&D is really an incredible game. It's very different from uh, games that had preceded it, and it puts both players and especially the person running the game, the Dungeon Master, into the position of being a game designer and being responsible for the game session that comes around. And so uh, I think that catapulted me into, uh, into game design. And what debt do we as gamers owe to Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, do you think? I think it's it's uh, it's a it's a very large gaming debt. I think that they uh, broke uh, a lot of the things which are sort of standards for games and um, and and came up with something which was really orthogonal to what had preceded it. And uh, it it basically it 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 uh, it said there was an idea of how large a space games were, and they just. Uh, uh, they, they did more than open up a new territory. It's like they added a whole new dimension to it. And, and so you went on to study mathematics. Why did you decide to go into that area? Was it, was it that you had a love for it? Was, it? was it that you had an aptitude for it? Or was it just a coincidence and a series of events that led you into it? 
Um, I've uh, always loved uh, math puzzles and math in, in mathematics and uh, in general, uh, and and I think that that's what led me to math. People ask me whether my math sort of helped me create games, and you know maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Uh, I mean, it certainly had some influence, but uh, um, I think my love for games and my love for math are are part of the same thing. They're not separate. And so, and so, uh, uh, because I, I felt like, uh, game design was not a sensible place to stake my future. Uh, I, I decided to go into math instead. So, I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, agonizing over my maths homework and my mum saying to me sort of, Oh, don't worry. I hated maths too. And, and, I always felt I was terrible at it. Do you think mathematic ability is innate, or is it something that can be taught? Can can someone be a mathematician, even if they seem to struggle at first? Oh, oh yeah, I, I think so. I think that uh, there's a lot uh, there's a lot of issues with how math is taught um, and how people uh, it, how, how people are introduced to it. Uh, but math is uh, is is much broader uh, a, a, as a subject than most people encounter in school and uh, and there's often some uh, something they run into which is uh, you know sort of completely cryptic to them and and doesn't resonate doesn't seem to have any position in, you know place in real life and drives them out of the whole uh, the whole field uh, but uh, but I think uh, with more care in how it's taught you can really uh, almost anybody can uh, get enjoyment out of mathematics. So I want to go on to your first game. We've already mentioned it, and this is D&D. So I think we've touched on it, but do you think you'd be anything like the person you are today without those first experiences with Dungeons & Dragons? I I really don't. Uh, I think I think things would have been very different. Uh, um, I, I think there's a good chance I would have ended up in games still, uh, that's impossible to say, of course, but uh, um, I thought that if perhaps I hadn't run into D and D and I hadn't started uh, really exploring uh, games uh, uh, passionately, that there's still no way I wouldn't have uh, run into arcade games, which uh, uh, were sort of becoming popular at the time, also, and and I loved those, and so I think there's a good chance I would have ended up in computer games instead. And so, were you a DM? Were you a player? Were you both? I, I was more often the DM than the player, but I, I was both. And did you design your own scenarios? And, and what were those scenarios like? If you did, uh, I I did design my own scenarios. I uh, uh, usually uh, I, I I hardly ever used any pre-made modules or anything like that. And uh, um, I usually uh, tried to sort of mess with what people understood was going on with the game and uh and uh um really uh, i i spent a lot of time also unsurprisingly playing with the systems themselves so what we actually played was not very much like dungeons and dragons uh but uh uh but sort of a role-playing game that evolved out of that and did you ever bump into gary gygax in your travels Briefly, uh, we we crossed paths uh, maybe a, a year before he died. Uh, at, uh, at he was being honored at uh, Gen Con, and uh, um, and uh, so it was a, a real uh, pleasure to run into the, him there and uh, and uh, meet him. And I also uh, did meet uh, Dave Arneson as well. And and was this something, because I I imagine I do this show and you know it's a great privilege for me to interview you and one of the great interviews I would love to get is Gary Gygax and of course that's not possible. Um, I mean, did you sort of fanboy when you you met him or or were you were you did you keep your car? Uh, I I'd say uh, certainly a fanboy on the inside. Uh, I'm pretty good at keeping my calm on the outside, but. Uh, um, there's a lot of people who have uh, influenced me and whose game design I admire, and so when I meet them, I'm I'm very excited to talk game design with them, and uh, and uh, tell them what an influence uh, they are and uh, how much I admire what they've done. And so I, I certainly uh, uh, 
uh, Gygax and Arneson are uh, the the number one slots for that for me. And so uh, uh, in both cases, I, I had a lot of, a lot of pleasure in, uh, in, in letting them know uh, how much I uh, uh, admired their design. And so d and Magic are examples of sort of first movers in a genre that have managed to stay at the top. What do you think it is, it is about D&D that has kept it where it is? Uh, well, there's... There's a lot of things which keep both D and D magic on top, D and D and magic on top. Uh, I think uh, one one of the things that both both games were good enough uh, that they were able to attract a lot of people, get them hooked, and good enough to be able to evolve to be really excellent games. Uh, the first uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons was. From a sort of game perspective, not you know there, there were a lot of problems with it, uh, but it got to a good place, and, and the same could be said for uh, Magic. Um, and uh, um, and then once you're in that position, uh, uh, the people who are playing the game have a lot of investment in the game, and uh, I don't mean uh, money-wise, uh, although that is often the case as well, but uh, much more importantly, uh, uh, investment in knowledge. Uh, they they understand how the system works and uh, um, and and starting up you you have to get a really big improvement to your game experience in order to uh, justify the switching cost to another game in the sort of the same same genre and uh, it's one of the things which uh, makes games in general so exciting is that uh, the with sort of the best games in my opinion um, the the better you know them, the better they become, uh, which is which makes them sort of more like music than books. They're often uh, compared to books or movies, but books and, mo- and movies to me are much more disposable than uh, games. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Jeff Engelstein, I, I spoke to on this show, he he says that, you know, if you play a game and you don't enjoy it, then bin that game and move on to the next one. And I've always found there's a number of games I have in my collection that I've played the first two times and detested them. And then something clicked in that third time. And, you know, they've grown into games that I absolutely adore now. So, yeah, there's certainly something in that, I think. Yeah, no, I'm... I'm very much of the camp that you have to put time into the game in order to get the best experience out of the game. But I do sympathize with the bin it and move on because there's these days there's so much. Um, and, uh, and designers are in a position where they have to take more responsibility for uh, a player's first experiences, although that's often impossible to do if the game has any sort of richness. Uh, somebody who was growing up uh, as I did didn't have the luxury of being able to uh, try a game and and then move on if they don't like it. Uh, uh, games were pricey, and they and and so and there weren't that many of them. And so when I got a game, you bet I played the hell out of it, even if I didn't like it the first time. And I usually learned to like it. Yeah, if I bought a CD as a kid, I listened to that CD until <laughs> I liked it because I didn't know when the next one was coming. Yes, yes. So I want to move on now. So firstly, I want to briefly talk about your, your mathematics. You, you studied combinatorial maths. Can you explain for us lay people what that is? Uh, yeah, combinatorics is the mathematics of counting things. Um, and uh, it is very relevant to uh, analyzing and, uh, and the structure of games. Uh, there are three major parts to combinatorics. There's enumeration, which is uh, is counting things. So uh, an enumerative combinatorial question is how many different poker hands are there, for example, or, you know, what are your odds of being dealt a particular combination? Uh, and and so probability is very tied into this. Uh, and then there's algorithms, uh, which uh, the mathematics of algorithms, which of course has a lot of relevance to uh, game rules and how they're played. Uh, and then there's graph theory, which uh, is a uh, um, sort of a study of networks, uh, uh, really, uh, and, uh, structures called graphs. And so if you hadn't have become a game designer, what do you think you would have gone on to do? Uh, I, I think I was heading 
down the road to being an academic. Uh, I expect uh, I would have become um, a, a an academic mathematician, college level. I would have uh, been teaching. Uh, I would have been uh, spending my free time, which one of the things I like about academics is that you often have some uh, uh, studying games and perhaps uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, explore them in sort of a, an intellectual way, even uh, even if I was it wasn't my uh, profession. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where I would have would have gone. So you pitched Robo Rally to Wizards of the Coast. Was this the first game that you pitched to a game company? Uh, yes, uh, Robo Rally was the first game that I considered publishable, and uh, I I did not personally pitch it to any company uh, because I did enough research to realize that it was really hard to get a game sold, and. So instead, uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, Mike Davis, who loved Rover Alley. I told him I would uh, share the game with him if he got it sold. And, uh, and he thought that was a very generous deal. And uh, after I think he worked on it seven years and pitched it to like eight different companies uh, and, and had it at all sorts of different stages of acceptance and uh, rejection and, and so forth, uh, after all that, he thought that it was not a generous deal but a fair deal. Mm. And so is it true that Wizards initially didn't publish it because they thought it would be too expensive for what was a fledgling company at the time, and they asked you to come up with something that would then turn into magic? Uh, yes, that's that's true. Uh, they Peter Adkisson uh, loved Roborelli, but yeah, it's 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 a Particular in those, particularly in those days, it's very expensive. It was very expensive putting together a game like that. These days, it's a, a little bit easier. Self-publishing, uh, publishing tools have gotten a lot more uh, uh, affordable and powerful. Uh, but uh, so he he wanted something which was uh, uh, fast to play, uh, cheap, and uh, and uh, uh, that that you could play while waiting in lines at events at Gen Con was uh, one of his descriptions. And uh, uh, I got everything correct, except it wasn't particularly cheap to make because uh, it, it sort of broke a lot of the rules for how games, card games were put together, and it had a very expensive art budget and so forth. But uh, at that point, he was excited about, not enough about it that, uh, that he uh, raised the money for it. And how did it feel to eventually get Robo Rally uh, published? Because you... you I mean, you'd been working on it since the eighties, right? Uh, it, it was it was very exciting. It, 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 Any time I get a game out, it's uh, it, it's exciting. It's still exciting. Uh, I, I love uh, being able to see other people get enjoyment out of things I've made. Um, I always have a strange relationship with my published products, however, uh, in that uh, uh, my my wife Coney. Uh, uh, complains that I hardly ever play my games with her, and uh, and every time I do, I, I actually enjoy them. But but I tend not to bring them out because uh, while I'm playing them, I'm always redesigning them, looking for flaws and uh, and so forth. So it becomes sort of uh, a little bit more stressful than uh, than I'd like. So when Robo Rally came out, I was very excited. But on the other hand, it was it was sort of I, I realized that uh, my journey with Robo Rally and with games in general certainly wasn't. It wasn't uh, ever going to be finished. So your next game then is is another classic, and this is a game that's been around as long as I've been around, and it's uh, it, it's held in incredible regard. And this is Cosmic Can Cosmic Encounter. Why do you think it's held in such regard, and what is so special about it? Well, I I can't say broadly why it's held in large regard i can uh, in high regard i can say from my own experience that it was uh, very influential on me and uh, maybe this reflects how it is for others as well but the idea of uh having a simple game where everybody had this one way to to break the rules was uh magic magical to me and eventually inspired magic uh, uh, perhaps indirectly but uh, but but the, the roots are definitely there um, this uh, and and my experience playing 
Cosmic Encounter was the first time I played it, uh, I was not impressed. Uh, I wasn't unimpressed. It just was not particularly interesting uh, to me. Then the second time I played it, it was completely different. And the third time I played it, it was completely different again. And, and then, then I, I fell in love with the game. It was just like uh, it, it was so much variety in the different ways it played out. And, uh, and that was even before we started doing things like uh, making it so you play with multiple alien powers each time uh, or you know, t- things like that. I mean, I, I I I heard an interview with one of the designers of Cosmic Encounter, and he said that you know, balance was for sissies, and and Cosmic is a game that requires the players to balance the game, and there's an incredible amount of above table interaction. What does this do to people sat around a table? How does it affect the way games are played? Well, I think it's a uh, it's it's very interesting, and it's been um, as a perspective. What balance is to a game is, is a very interesting topic, and, and Cosmic Encounter put that, puts that in the forefront. And it's forefront in my mind right now because I've recently put out a game called uh, Keyforge, and balance is uh, kind of out the window on Keyforge and intentionally so. Um, so when you when you play a game like Cosmic Encounter, which is sort of overtly unbalanced, uh, you – you are put in this position where uh, you have to, in some ways, you have to play the game more casually, which is makes it for many people more fun. Uh, this does not mean that there's less skill in the game. Um, in that, uh, but but it does mean that you are sometimes in a position where you are fighting much greater uh, forces than you have, and it gives you the chance to really overcome massive odds and win uh, uh, rather than every time just playing a fair game. So it's, it's very exciting. It, in, it, 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 this is illustrated in, in Keyforge. Uh, Keyforge, uh, um, every deck is unique, and a lot of people have complained about the balance issues. There's ways to handicap the decks and so forth, but, the, but, but when I was playing uh, with my son and – a deck came to the table that was powerful, we weren't fighting to play that deck. We were fighting to play against that deck because there's no glory to winning with a with a powerful deck, right? And so it's a similar thing with Cosmic Encounter. It's fun to sit down and play the you know combination of powers which is broken and sort of steamroller everybody, but the really fun games are when you're playing against those and you figure out how to overcome them and you're sort of scrapping for every advantage you can along the road. It's uh, when when you play computer games. Oftentimes, uh, you know, it's like, do you want a fair game against the AI, or do you want a hard game? Usually, I put it on the hardest settings mm. and see if I can overcome what the computer throws at me. And uh, and that you know, cosmic encounter is is sort of like that. It allows you to play these uh, massively uneven fights, and uh, and uh, and I find that really exciting. So if you were to design an alien for the game, what would it be? Uh, unfortunately, I am, I'm not uh, at my, my house where I have my original Cosmic Encounter, and I could answer that by look, opening it up and looking and seeing what <laughs> aliens I actually made. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, so, so I have to rely on my memory, which is not right now uh, so great. But... Uh, uh, it would be it would be something I, I, I love playing with meta rules so uh, so it would probably be something uh, very meta um, and uh, something which interacted in weird ways with, uh, with in, in different ways depending on what aliens came out uh, but uh, I'm afraid I I, I, I'm, I can't give a give a particular example right now I can say one of the one of the powers that I really liked from the, and also whatever I designed there's a very good chance it's been designed there's a, mm. they've designed hundreds of powers and the fan community has designed uh, thousands probably but uh one of my favorites was from the original set and it was the seeker um and you were allowed to ask yes or no questions to other players and they had to answer yes or no and then uh uh, be truthful and if it uh, referred to the future uh, they had to abide by that answer and this was Mm -hmm. felt 
kind of wimpy at first, but then when we started playing it and asking about future events, it suddenly became very interesting, and it began to be things like you know, uh, next time you uh, uh, are in a fight, are you going to play a card that's greater than 40 or g- greater than 20 or something like that? Uh, and and so then they wouldn't have any idea because they don't know who they're fighting or what the situation is going to be or whether they're going to have one, and so they say yes or no. And you start getting this roster of things they're committed to in the future. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and we we had sort of these games end up with this sort of very complicated situation where people had to go through this uh, long checklist of what they were allowed to do and in what order. And uh, it was a uh, uh, it, it it and so it was very exciting to see this game this sort of a uh, uh, power that was formerly regarded as being kind of mediocre become really interesting to play and uh, and often quite powerful. So I want to go on now and talk about what you're most well known for and that's magic so what was the genesis for the game so you were asked by wizards to design something but how did it become magic uh well briefly shortly after meeting uh peter atkinson and him making that request uh, i had this uh epiphany that uh, um players didn't have all have to all have the same material and and this was very exciting to me from a game design perspective that you could uh, have one pl- person playing with one set of cards or components and another person playing with another one. And uh, and at that point, there was no magic. There was just this concept, this game design concept. And uh, a- after that, I cast around for a good flavor and set of mechanics. I, wasn't e- I remember telling him I wasn't even sure if it was possible to make a game like that, uh, I said, and and that's because uh, when you think about poker or uh, bridge, where you're allowed to choose your own hand, it doesn't become more interesting; it becomes less interesting. Mm. And uh, and and so most of the games I could think of uh, were not improved by customizing your side freely, and uh, and and so it took a little while to come up with uh, with. And it, it blows my mind that I that I thought that it po- wasn't possible. It, it might not be possible because today it's so obvious. Mm. Uh, there's so many different uh, ways to balance decks and make it so that the choices for players are interesting and so forth. Uh, but uh, but at the time I wasn't sure, and uh, it took a a few months before I came up with Magic, and uh, it was built on the back of a of a card game that I've been working on for a long time, which was inspired by Cosmic Encounter. The idea being that in Cosmic, every player had one or two different ways to break the rules. And I thought if you could have a card game where every card broke the rules, that would be really exciting. And so that was what Magic began as. And then that turned out to be a, a really excellent vehicle for for a trading card game. And so... Are there any significant things that you culled from that early design that we don't see in the modern game of Magic now? Oh, yes. Uh, there, there were a, a lot of... Basic, for, first of all, there was no set design. It was sort of a, a space of design because I'd been working on that game for I don't know, five years maybe, and uh, maybe even longer. And, and I probably never played the same game twice. Uh, every time I tinkered with it and changed the rules, uh, but uh, so th- things that were lost along the way, there were times where uh, there was a map. There were times where you laid out cards into a map, and you actually had movement around the uh, moved on the cards uh, as acting as different territories. Um, and uh, uh, there were times where it was. Uh, built to be multiplayer and probably wouldn't have worked so well as a two-player game. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, there, were, there, were, there was no fixed magic before that point. And so did you also design the game with collectability, with random packs, with boosters, that sort of thing in mind, or did that come later? Uh, no, it, 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 the, the distribution of rarity was established very early, uh, so it was designed with that in mind. Um, the uh, what was motivating me was not collectability, but uh, variety. Uh, I, I was interested in making a 
making basically a gigantic game where everybody got dealt a hand. And uh, if I could have made uh, a a thousand cards, different types of cards, I would have. And uh, the rarity, the the commonality and rarity are important from, uh, to me, not because uh, of collectability, but because they, the common cards give you uh, something you can predict and understand about the environment. You can learn uh, uh, how the world works in general, and the rare cards uh, are the spice. They're the things which uh, change things that are exciting to see because you don't see them very often. And uh, I wanted both those things in the game. In the game, I didn't want to have it. If I could have made a thousand cards, I would have. But I wouldn't have made them all the same rarity. I would have made common cards still because I want people to have something they can rely on in the environment and rare cards, which uh, which uh, you don't see very often. And so, how long did it take you to realize that this was not just going to be a flash in the pan, not just another design? This was going to be a real juggernaut, a big hit, an institution. Uh, I, I was surprised by how popular it was, how well it was taking off constantly for the first couple of years. Uh, it was like every every time I heard a story about something new and crazy that had happened, uh, 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 I was uh, uh, blown away. Um, I so I guess I guess within those years, I, I figured uh, it was possibly going to be a juggernaut, uh, as, as you termed it. Um, but I wasn't confident that it was going to be what I wanted, which was an evergreen game, mm-hmm. until, um, until we managed to solve the problem of uh, an overload of cards uh, by making it so that the cards expired, that uh, the standard way to play is with uh, uh, the, the previous uh, year or two of sets. Once that was established, then the game can last forever. Because until then, every set that came out was making it so it was more and more uh, difficult for new players to join and uh, and less and less exciting because every card you put out has to compete with a sea of previous cards. But, but once you limit it and say, oh, we're only going to use the most recent year or two years or something like that, you're in a stable position. Anytime anybody's joining the game, they've only have they have a, a, a similar amount of things to keep track of, and the cards are similarly exciting relative to the uh, environment that's out there. And so, you know, you hear reports and you, you read things about a Black Lotus going for thirty thousand dollars and things like this. What is your view of the secondary market? Do you find it just just absurd? I, I do, uh, and uh, scary. Uh, I, uh, I I I like. The cards being collectible in the sense that stamps are collectible, uh, where you, you you might have something worth something over a long period of time. But what I don't like and didn't like at the time was cards that are collectible immediately, like uh, they're immediately worth a lot. Mm. Uh, because that's very, uh, I think, hostile to players trying to play the game. Uh, and in fact, catering to collectors was something which a lot of uh, wizards wanted to do in the early days, and uh, I and many of the people in R&D made a lot of effort to explicitly trying to drive them out of the market. Um, and uh, and and that was because you, it's like if people are are, are uh, buying the game and just watching the value go up, they're not playing the game, and it just makes the game more expensive for everybody else. So when Fallen Empires came out, which was I don't know the six expansion or something like that. Um, we intentionally printed so much that we knew that it could not hold its value. Hmm. And uh, and a lot of people said at that point, that's it. The magic is finished. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's crashed. It's all over. But uh, for me, that was when, uh, that was another point where this game might last forever because now people could actually afford to play the game. And, uh, and uh, so... I've got kind of an antagonistic relationship with uh, the collectors. In fact, I insist on calling them trading card games because I think that uh, that emphasizes the the play of the game rather than collectible card game, which I think it's uh, kind of arrogant to make something and tell people, oh, this is collectible. 
Mm. And so what's your involvement with Magic now? Uh, I, I still uh, work on a set with Wizards from time to time. My la- the last one I worked on was a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, keep in touch with the guys who are working on it. But, uh, but my uh, involvement is, is very light. I, I, don't, uh, I don't work on it regularly and I don't keep up with it. So your next game then is Titan, and this is an old Avalon Hill game. How important are these games to you as a game? Oh, they're they're very important. Uh, I, I'm very big into the history of games, um, uh, both history as I was growing up and history back, you know, into into the millennia. Um, but uh, uh, Avalon Hill was very important uh, to the game community when I was a kid uh, um, and because there weren't many there were very few companies that made games for hobbyists that were uh, and, and, and Avalon Hill made a lot of games with a lot of variety explored a lot of very interesting different mechanics um, and uh, the games were much more complicated um, than is uh, standard these days. Uh, the rules were like uh, procedural manuals uh, or something like that. Uh, uh, and, they, and of course, their, their roots were in war games, which are uh, uh, often very complicated. But uh, um, they, they were very important uh, for me and I think a lot of hobbyists at the time uh, for learning all the wonderful things you could do with games. So I want to go on now and talk about Three Donkeys and your teaching work. So you run Three Donkeys. What does the company do? I, 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 it deals with analog games and digital games. Yes, that's true. Uh, it, it, it's a game design and consultant consulting company. Uh, so, and it's, it's just, uh, uh, there's only uh, uh, me and uh, Scaff Elias and uh, 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 Coney, Coney Garfield. Uh, we, uh, you, uh, I design games. Uh, he and I uh, work in developing our games and other people's games. Uh, we consult with uh, uh, both uh, paper game companies and electronic uh, game companies. Um, we have uh, published a, a, a manual, uh, not a manual, a, a textbook on uh, game design with uh, Robert Cachera. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And so what is the difference? What are the different challenges between dealing with digital games and analog games? Uh, there have been many times I've thrown my hands up and said I'm not going to deal with computer games anymore. Uh, they're very frustrating to deal with. But the the thing is that there's so much power uh, there and uh, it's so exciting, the possibilities of uh, the computer game space that I can't keep away. Um, so... Uh, for me, one of the biggest differences is that it's much harder to prototype. Um, and uh, the when I'm making paper games, I am of I, I like to prototype quickly, test a game, make another prototype, test again. And when I'm working on a computer game, I've been in a position where I've been able to prototype rather rapidly in the right circumstances, but in general it's like you've got to have these game design documents where you have everything sussed out and, and it's like that's an anathema to me because i don't even know at that the, the the sort of games i'm usually making are different enough that it's really hard to tell if they're going to be fun until you actually try them hmm. like if i were just doing another uh, real-time strategy game and uh you know just you know adding one or two tweaks to it i could do that with a document and you know wait for uh nine months until I have a playable prototype and we'd be just fine. But usually the sort of games I'm working in are, are, are working on are much more different than that. So they're hard to uh, model in your head. And so you also teach a class in games at the University of Washington. What is that course about? Um, well, uh, I think that's uh, old, old information you're dealing oh, with. Uh, okay. uh, I, oh, I have okay. not taught a class there in probably uh, probably nine years ago I, it was the last one I taught but I was teaching a game basically oriented around uh, the, the, the the textbook which uh, which we were putting together at the time 
And, and so how important is it, do you think, that universities run courses in game design? Because it seems to me that especially Tabletop has operated on a sort of ad hoc system with sort of people in sheds. Do you, do you think that it needs to be codified in a sort of university course? Uh, I Needs to be is, is hard to say. Uh, it's gotten along just fine without it. Mm. But, uh, but I, I think it's a, a tragic that it hasn't been. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, it's I mean games I think are fascinating uh, again historically what uh, you know what uh, ta- taxonomically what the different types of games are what the different types of mechanics are there's so many different uh, questions which uh, I think uh, would be really nice to have uh, studied understood codified uh, in the same way in which people study movies or books or music and so forth games are uh, as rich a uh, uh, an area for study as any of these things and and uh, and it's a, it's right now uh, as culturally important as anything else um, and uh, and so I think it's uh it's it's long overdue so in a critical sense as well as a vocational sense absolutely yes uh, um, I think uh, uh, I think they, they they sort of they go hand in hand. I think you need uh, uh, critique really uh, helps uh, advance the study. So your next game then is uh, Spiel des Jahres winner and sort of very innovative in and of itself. And this is Hanabi. So how special is the design of this game? To me, it's it's uh, Hanabi is a is a really uh, special and outstanding game, of course, because otherwise it wouldn't be on my uh, my grab list. Uh, Doomsday, um, Hanabi is a is it, well, it's a cooperative game, um, and cooperative games have been very popular in the last five ten years. Uh, but there's always, for me, there's always been this uh, these issues with the cooperative games, which make it so that uh, they're much more uh, disposable experiences than um, than head-to-head games, uh, and uh, because you get this sense of uh, I'm going to try to beat the system, and then once you've figured it out, um, then you can up the difficulty. But uh, but then uh, the game gets to the games tend to get to this point where where a few people are have gotten very good at it, and they're driving a lot of the action for the rest of the group. Hmm. And uh, um, and for me that. So, so that means that playing a cooperative game the first couple times is usually fun for me, but after that I usually stop enjoying it. Uh, Hanabi broke that in one of the ways in which I think that can be broken, which is to make it so that each person has hidden information which can't be shared. Uh, and, and there's a lot of games with cards in it, and they sort of wave their hand and they say, well, you can't share it except what's strategically important or something like that. And that, to me, is just... Uh, BS, uh, because uh, it's it's sort of forcing the players to choose what makes sense to share and what doesn't. And uh, and Hanabi, the whole game collapses if you're allowed to talk about what your hands are, and so everybody knows that you can't talk about your hand. Mm-hmm. You have to clue your hand by uh, your play, and uh, it sort of felt to me like an instant classic. It did exactly what I want to see from a, co- a cooperative game. Uh, where uh, I felt like uh, uh, when I played that I could be clever uh, and uh, my part, the people I'm playing with could be clever and nobody ever was in a position where they could tell you what you could do, what you should do until after the game, you could do a critique session. Um, and, uh, and so I, I find it uh, endlessly fun to play. Um, uh, you can refine your systems that you play with. Uh, and the more you refine them, the more difficulty levels you can play. So it's a it's a wonderful game. And so, do you think it's a game that promotes ownership per group, and every group sort of has their particular Hanabi method? Well, yeah, I, I can see that happening. Um, uh, I guess I, I haven't played with too many out of my groups, but every time we play with a new group, we sort of let people uh, explore the game, and then we start uh, talking about different ways we might um, uh, we might play differently in order to improve ourselves. So we sort of reconstruct the game uh, for for the group. But uh, w- when I sit down and play with somebody who knows what they're doing, uh, 
usually we lay down some ground rules, but we uh, we still sort of explore the game and uh, as if we didn't know what our opponent, our, our par- opponents, our partners were going to uh, do, and and so then we would develop the game from there. So I want to talk now about the future. So what is what is in the future world of Richard Garfield? So you just had Keyforge, and will you be continuing to, continuing to be working on that? Uh, oh gosh, uh, yes. Um, Keyforge has been uh, a much bigger handful than I expected. Uh, uh, I've uh, I have designed, I think, uh, maybe two years worth of cards, and uh, and that's. It's been, which has been a real challenge, considering uh, I, I didn't know how how people were going to engage with the game, mm. um, and what they were going to like in the game, and what they weren't going to like. Uh, but uh, um, I, I am hopeful that that at this point that I can uh, step back and begin working on some other designs. Uh, I would, in particular, like to work on some more unique deck games. I think that's a very rich rich uh, area. That, uh, that that a lot could be done with, um, and uh, and be more of a consultant with the future design uh, as happened with Magic. The team at uh, Fantasy Flight has become, you know, are, are getting up to speed and getting much better at doing the design and development uh, themselves. Uh, so hopefully, I'll step back. So you design Magic, you design Robo Rally, you now have Keyforge, which is a huge hit. Um, there's no question that you're you know, huge in the board game landscape. What keeps you involved with it? Oh, well, uh, so there's, there's a bunch of things that keeps me involved, but uh, um, when when your livelihood is your passion, uh, you, there just never seems any reason to, to, to disengage from it. Um, and, uh, and I am constantly excited by what new games are coming out, what new things th- people are thinking of, and I want to take those and figure how it would impact my design. Uh, I'm constantly looking for uh, new new game experiences that don't exist and trying to make those myself as well. Um, I just I, I think the, 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 era, the, the space of games is so exciting and huge and unexplored that it's hard to keep out of it. So your last game then is another classic and sort of a classic outside of the hobby board gaming world and this is poker so why are you taking poker to the cabin i debated on whether uh i should uh take uh some decks of cards and take therefore all card games or uh, uh take one game so uh, but i decided it was more in the spirit of the grab to grab uh, grab poker than yeah, you played within the rules which is yeah, great. you played two, within two the rules which is great um but uh um poker Poker. It used to be. I used to say Go was my favorite game, and mm. Go is is certainly an amazing game. But over time, uh, poker has uh, surpassed that. Um, poker is an incredible game, and it teaches so much about uh, about games. Uh, for for example, um, it's very flexible in, uh, in 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 how much time it takes up. Uh, you, a hand of poker is very fast, but you can play poker tournaments and poker uh, seasons, and you can fit poker sessions into any any uh, amount of time that you have available. Um, poker is very uh, human because you can't extract a person's play. You can't reduce a person's play uh, just down to numbers. There's always this uh, opportunity to uh, read other people and uh, I, I love games with game theoretic situations where you know something your opponent does, doesn't and you are motivated to play in such a way that they don't figure out what you know. Uh, that is such a rich area for game play and one that I, I often find uh, I have to look a little harder for than I like in the current game industry. Um, and, and I love the fact that poker is a... Uh, it's uh, not just a game, but it's like an operating system for games. Uh, when I play poker, 
it's so easy to come up with variations and mm. new versions of poker, and each of them is uh, uh, fun on its own to explore, like little treasures. And uh, um, and, and and so I think uh, that's a marvelous thing about poker. And so, what's your favorite variety of poker, and why do you think it's Texas Hold'em that has been the one that has really sort of galloped off with the public's imagination? Um, well, Texas Hold'em has a lot of strengths. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I think the main reason it's galloped off is because it was the uh, the form that was so heavily promoted in uh, in the uh, '90s and uh, uh, turn of the century, um, but. Uh, um, but the reason it was so heavily promoted is because of its virtues, which is that uh, you can seat uh, an enormous number of people uh, can play, which you can't with seven card stud or draw. Um, and so much of the action is visible to everybody, which makes it so that it's uh, very good for spectators. Um, so, so those are two wonderful things about uh, Texas Hold'em. Um, and, uh, um, another thing is that uh, whenever a game is taken seriously, uh, it tends to be uh, I, I, I dominated. I'm, I'm worried that might be too strong a word, but it might be just the right word. Uh, dominated by uh, people, uh, by um, game strategy honers, people who uh, want to really study and get to the last decimal digit of of the proper play and study it. And so those players which uh, take the game so seriously and build such a such a vibrant community out of it they're very interested in nailing down a single form of game which they can master completely uh, and so there's this uh, this this uh, um, uh, difficulty in getting in, in getting another game taken seriously mm-hmm. and there are a few other games that are taken seriously but 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 yeah uh, Texas Hold'em is is premier because of all those reasons now what do i like the best uh um i uh i I love uh dealer's choice where you sit down and you play uh whatever the dealer wants and sometimes Mm -hmm. you play a bunch of those games so that you can uh get in the groove and uh and figure out how that particular game works but uh um uh so so i've got fond fond memories of the the dealer's choice uh games and i like playing wacky variations in a, for a tournament um my particular if i had to pick one version to play i really like uh, uh the version where you play high low and you uh take your cards you your seven cards you choose five and you roll them over one at a time and you make bets after each after mm. each reveal uh there's a lot of uh bluff there about whether you're going high or low and uh you get to present your hand in a particular uh a particular way which uh, paints a picture which uh uh hopefully is to your advantage so one last question then you're heading off to the cabin you're driving down the road at 88 miles an hour and you go around the corner and the back seat of the car flies open five of the games fly out of the car down a ravine and are swept away by the river which game do you hope is sitting in the back seat? Uh, you, you mean four of the games? Oh, sorry, sorry. Did I? I've done that a hundred times, and it's the only time I've got it wrong. Yeah, four of the games are swept away. Which one do you I, hope I was, is sitting in the I back was seat? I was really depressed. I thought, oh no, because <laughs> uh, uh, I, I thought you were going to ask me what what my new hobby is going to be. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm hoping Dungeons and Dragons is still back there. There's, uh, in, in some ways, that's almost a cheap answer because uh, Dungeons and Dragons, like uh, for me contains all the other games it's a uh it's it's a world inside uh inside a game so if people want to know what you're up to how would they go about finding that out uh uh i i i don't know do you have a do you have a website do you have a twitter handle i i do have a a, a facebook page but i don't really i haven't been keeping up with, with it recently what what is it it's a yeah, I've got a Richard Garfield Facebook page, and and I occasionally update that with some with some material. So uh, that I do not do I do not Twitter. Uh, so so that's that's no use. That's very wise. So Richard Garfield, thank you very much. Well, thank you for uh, the uh, uh, interview. It was, a, it was a lot of fun to talk about games. Always.
And if you want to suggest a guest, or you want to say something nice about the show, or you want to say something horrible about the show, you can contact me on at 5 games for Doomsday on Twitter, or you can send me an email at 5 games for Doomsday at gmail.com. You can give a rolling donation to help support the show at patreon.com forward slash 5G for D, or a one-time PayPal donation at the bottom of the website 5 games for Doomsday.com. And if you fancy looking swanky, you can buy a t-shirt at tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash 5 games for Doomsday. And if I haven't had to abscond from the lime-flavoured snow and the people who seem to find cats just a bit too funny. I'll see you next week for another Five Games for Doomsday. Doomsday.